Let's talk about the UN building. Um, can you tell us just really briefly about the history and the, and the project itself? I'll talk, I'll talk about the history and then John, sure. you can <coughs> talk about our interventions, but I do feel that the project uh, has been well overdue. It's, it's, it has not been renovated since the, it was built, 1952, 51, uh, and it's because the UN has a growing mandate to spend its money in places where there's poverty or earthquake or warfare or all the things that the UN does. Uh, Mayor Giuliani came to the UN after 9-11 and said, I am not going to send my firefighters into your house if you have an event uh, because it's not safe and we don't, it's not, it's not up to code. And all buildings, although you're not in New York City, you do re re rely upon the first responders. Mm -hmm. So I think that generated the interest in doing a, 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 a project and Within a few years, there was a motivation to put together $2 billion and do the project. Hmm. Well, from a, uh, a standpoint of what did we look at and mm -hmm. what couldn't we do for various reasons, and energy was always on the forefront, and budget was always on the forefront. And how do you blend those two things in a way that we're reducing energy, and at the same time, not spending a lot of the stakeholders' money to do that. So you know, as an example, um, we looked at the skin and we reduced energy by well over 50% within the overall building. And we did that through an insulated glass assembly. Mm -hmm. And we did that through you know, shading on the outside with blinds. We did that through lighting levels that got modulated up, up and down. We did that through efficient mechanical engineering systems. But we did look at elements such as a double wall assembly on the outside. And you know, that proved to be very costly for a number of reasons, whether it be the imposition of load on the structure or the cost of a double layer glass, when in fact we could achieve something that was more than fine based on what we have in place now. Are there other parts of the design that you find particularly innovative, interesting, applicable maybe to other projects? The sandwich between the top of the deck and the ceiling was about two foot, 11 inches. And there's about eight inches of structure, which doesn't leave a lot of space for anything else in it. We implemented well over 12 systems within that sandwich. And it's all about how does one be creative about defining space and allocation of space, but at the same time, we looked at systems that can go below, like the dimming systems, where we can take advantage of a building that, that, that's that narrow, that can harvest a lot of light, and capitalize on reducing the lighting levels based on the amount of light that comes in from the outside. Hmm. Not many buildings in our time are looking at the exterior window wall in composition with the interior wall as one system. In many cases, they're looking at them as either the exterior or either the interior. And what we looked to do was to blend those two things together. Hmm. And the end result was a lot of energy savings. What do you think should be done with the massive stock of mid-century office buildings primarily, or just the massive stock of outmoded um, buildings that we find ourselves dealing with, especially when it comes to energy efficiency? Uh, the reality is, is that the marketplace is actually looking at those buildings as prime real estate. And why is that? Predominantly because they have higher floor to floor heights in many cases. Yet at the same time, they have much larger footprints. Um, a lot of those buildings were built when the codes were a little different. And as a result of that, one needs to look at how we can revitalize those buildings and make them more marketable. If I may, uh, I do, I do, I totally agree and I, for a uh, somewhat different reason. I, uh, I, I have a his my background is the preservation movement and that's why I was working on the UN. And I do feel that the preservation movement has to move beyond iconic buildings and uh, heritage buildings and significant buildings and move to the run of the mill. Uh, 30 story, 20 story, we, all buildings need to be considered for recycling because they do incorporate tremendous embodied energy. Uh, they need to be, buildings need to be, and they're not, and not just beautiful buildings and special buildings where treaties were signed, but buildings just mm -hmm. need to be recycled.
Hmm. Do you think clients are more receptive to that line of thinking than they used to be, or is it still an uphill battle? I think as we get more as we get more tornadoes and hurricanes, and as the as the ocean rises, it'll become very everyone will become more receptive. What do you think is the most under addressed issue in tall building design development management, um, and how would you address it? Something that's not being talked about or not being talked about enough or in the right way. When does a tall building end? Uh, buildings. Uh, short buildings have a sort of known life, and it's when the real estate values overcome the value of the building, and then you, you're, you're better off using that land for something else. Every building has a, life, has a lifespan. It, nothing's infinite. Uh, tall buildings obviously have a long lifespan, but, there is, but it is finite. And the issue is when figuring out when that is, or the demolition and, of it? Or and what how next? do you do a tall building removal? in an urban, tight environment. It, it could be incredibly expensive. I think we're almost out of time, but if there's anything either of you'd like to add, just about maybe the, the legacy of the UN. Uh, the UN, of course, is a, uh, is a target in many ways, and we've had to implement in the renovation uh, many different systems in order to pr better protect the UN from, from terrorism and from bad, bad people. Uh, and it's, in, it's incorporated into the design. The glass has certain attributes, mm -hmm. and the steel frame that John's firm designed behind the glass uh, has certain attributes that, that allow us to be uh, reassured that we can withstand a certain level of blast that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a messy world. I think blast has become, and I know from our consultants who do only blast, that it's uh, the corporate world is now looking more and more at safety for their own mm -hmm. organizations because everyone has a certain exposure. Mm -hmm.